Good afternoon, uh, friends, alumni, students, and colleagues, and welcome to this uh, very special uh, edition of the Mason Science Series events. Uh, I am Fernando Morales Wilhelm, and it's my honor to serve as the Dean of the Mason College of Science. Uh, this is our second Mason Science Series event in 2021. Uh, last month, uh, Dr. Arthi Narayanan gave an amazing talk about her research on COVID-19. Um, and we have another special event coming up on April 27th, uh, featuring uh, Dr. Shobidas Satyapal, who will be discussing detecting supermassive black holes in space. Uh, so uh, wonderful. Um, you know, March is uh, Women's History Month, and I'm especially proud that our three internationally recognized researchers features, featured this spring all happen to be female. And most people are surprised to learn that our College of Science on the graduate student population is over 60% female. Uh, and the graduate student population is more than 50% female. These are exceptional statistics for female representation in STEM fields across any college of science. I'm actually on a quest to discover there's a peer institution with a higher percentage of female students in STEM uh, than us. Um, so far, I haven't found one. Um, you know, as a scientist for over 30 years and now as dean of this extraordinary college of science uh, for nearly one year, um, diversity as, as, as broad as we can define it, is a core value of me, of mine personally, um, in an area of explicit focus for our college and for our university. Every study that we've seen in terms of impacts of participation of diverse groups of people in science points to the fact that you get better results, you get results that are more impactful as you involve a wider diversity of people. But of course, diversity extends beyond gender, from ancestry to religion, to culture, to socioeconomic conditions, to all sorts of background. Um, the College of Science is committed to inclusive excellence and to enhancing a culture that is welcoming and nurturing to all. Now, before I introduce our uh, speaker for today, I just wanted to point out a few uh, Zoom housekeeping comments. Uh, uh, this event will be recorded and a link will be shared and posted on our website after the event. Questions can be submitted using your name or anonymous at any time using the Q&A box, uh, which is uh, located in the, in the bottom part of your Zoom screen. Um, and um, we will be discussing questions following the presentation. Um, attendee, microphones, cameras, chat and raise hand features are disabled for the event in order to provide continuity. Um, so with those uh, uh, housekeeping issues out of the way, um, um, it is my pleasure to introduce my distinguished colleague, uh, Dr. Jennifer Salerno. Um, Dr. Salerno is an assistant professor in Mason's Department of Environmental Science and Policy. She's also a researcher at the Potomac Environmental Research and Education Center uh, with a laboratory at the Potomac Science Center on the Occoquan River. Uh, her research lab focuses on the ecology of symbiotic and free living microorganisms in the environment. Recognizing the important link between human health and ecosystem health, uh, her research is approached through the lens of seeking to advance basic science while also developing environmental monitoring tools, practical applications, and policy guidance for environmental research, resource management, management and conservation. Her fascination with microbes have taken her to Antarctica and also to the bottom of the ocean. So I haven't met anyone who's been at both of these places ever. Um, she once dove in Alvin, uh, the human occupied vehicle in one of the world's first deep ocean submersibles that enables data collection and observation by scientists to depths of reaching 4,500 meters. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Salerno will discuss the roles that microorganisms play in maintaining and uh, stabilizing the health of organisms and what they can tell us about the health state of ecosystems. She will share her insights on, on, her, on her research, including an ongoing study of devastating coral disease outbreak that is currently decimating reefs across Florida and the Caribbean, and collaborative work being done to try to identify 
the causal agent. So it is my pleasure to leave you with my dear esteemed colleague, Dr. Jennifer Salerno. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, I just wanna make sure first that everyone can see my presentation here. Wonderful. Okay, so I know we're in the middle of a pandemic, but I'm hoping at the end of today's talk, you'll have maybe a new appreciation, um, maybe even an interest in microorganisms <clears throat> beyond the COVID or coronavirus. Um, but to start, I'll start out by telling a little bit about my story about how I became interested, because I guarantee you when I started out as an undergraduate at Rutgers University, I was not that interested in microorganisms or things that I could not see. So perhaps I was lacking a bit of imagination at that time, um, but as an aspiring marine biologist, um, my, the holy grail was for me to find my way to the Great Barrier Reef as depicted here in this beautiful um, image where we all wish we could uh, locate or relocate ourselves to right now at this moment in time. And so I had gotten a scholarship and saved up to study abroad. And um, this is, was really my, a turning point for me, my first exposure. Uh, and is especially exciting as someone that had learned to dive in um, a boat basin in New Jersey in November, another extreme environment that I have visited. Um, so when I stuck my head underwater for the first time, I was absolutely mesmerized by what I saw. And I was particularly taken by the different uh, interesting relationships on reefs. So symbiotic relationships where you have two organisms that are living together and both benefiting from partnerships. So you all are probably really familiar with this one here, <clears throat> clownfish and sea anemones that live together and provide each other with protection and nutrition. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you might be slightly less familiar with these feeding stations on reefs where these turtles and larger fish come cruising in almost like a landing strip uh, at an airport and all these little fish come up and start picking, actually cleaning the parasites off these turtles and fish. And as I continued on um, uh, with this course, so I'd actually been able to visit this island as part of a, a two week research course. And the more I learned, I became even more fascinated by the symbiosis within the coral themselves. So just to briefly orient you, you're looking up uh, very closely at a coral colony. So corals are actually related to jellyfish and, if, uh, and also anemones. So you can think of these as sort of mini anemones. So corals are colonial organisms. They have many of these polyps, which is what these individual units are here. And the center is a mouth and it's surrounded by tentacles. So they can ta uh, capture tiny floating plankton in the water. But in fact, they get most of their nutrition from these intracellular symbionts that live inside their tissues and the brownish dots coloration across these polyps here are actually these individual microorganisms. So the microorganisms get a place to live. They're not floating around in the plankton where they might get eaten. And in return, these are actually uh, photosynthetic. So they take the um, food that they make from photosynthesis and actually translocate it to the coral host where providing most of the nutrition for the coral. So what's also really fascinating about the symbiosis is that it's what actually enables corals to form these huge extensive structures and, and they build skeletons, right? So underneath this thin layer is a calcium carbonate skeleton. And so it's so large, and in this case, in the Great Barrier Reef, it can actually be seen from space via satellite. So the light coloration here is the Great Barrier Reef. And that structure also provides habitat for a huge diversity of other organisms that live in all the nooks and crannies, as well as it provides food as some organisms actually eat the corals themselves. And so it's a fascinating array, and that's why they're often known as the rainforests of the sea. And then if you peel away another layer and look even deeper, um, you see that there's actually a reef within a reef. So I started to learn that in addition to those photosynthetic endosymbionts, which are also called uh, colloquially zooxanthellae, which is also just another really fun word to say, um, they have all of these different other types of microorganisms that live on the mucus layer inside the coral tissue and in the skeleton. And this whole unit together, the coral organism itself and these other microorganisms are often referred to as the holobionts. So just tuck that in the back of your mind and I'll return to that concept a bit later. 
So when I returned back um, to my home institution, this really set me on a path um, to become interested in microorganisms. And I started to study them in different environments as, um, <clears throat> as uh, Fernando mentioned. So I went on to receive my master's degree at the College of William and Mary. Um, and that was when I got to dive in the Alvin. So I studied deep sea microbial symbionts. And in a lot of ways, these ecosystems are uh, sort of parallel corals, and they too are based on microbial symbioses. So I studied organisms that live around hydrothermal vents. They're essentially underwater volcanoes. And those conditions uh, would normally be uninhabitable for most multicellular organisms, but they engage in these symbioses with bacteria that are able to take the chemicals down there and essentially use it to generate in energy and make their own food. And so that was a really fascinating environment to study. I went on to obtain my PhD at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And in that case, I was actually looking at the bacteria on corals that keep them healthy. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And then I came to Mason to do a postdoc where I was actually investigating the impact of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill on deep sea coral bacteria and also biofilms that form on shipwrecks, which are sort of the precursors to seed them to become artificial reefs. <clears throat> and then I'll talk a little bit more today about my ongoing work. Um, so the more that I started to dive into this research and it took me to all these fascinating places. In fact, at some points along the way, friends and family would stop and ask and say, you're a marine biologist. Why don't you study something cool like turtles or sharks, which are very cool, by the way. Um, <clears throat> but microbes live everywhere, pretty much everywhere. And so I was able to travel to all these different places um, like Antarctica. But in my travels, there was a common theme that I started to observe, and it was the, um, the distinct human footprint that was left behind in these very <clears throat> remote areas, the bottom of the ocean, Antarctica, the end of the earth, right? Even these very remote island ecosystems. A lot of that was in the form of, unfortunately, plastic waste and other pollution. And so along my timeline here that led me to Mason, I started to become interested in, um, in science policy and the different laws and legislation and policies that um, really um, uh, influence how these spaces are managed and are protected. And so you can see highlighted in blue here are the areas in which I um, then dove into the policy world. So I spent some time on Capitol Hill um, working on ocean and energy policy. And then more recently as a science and technology policy fellow at the Department of State. I finally landed here at my home in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy where I can really integrate those two um, facets and it's really been uh, both uh, fulfilling professionally and personally. So to dive back into the microbes now. Um, so what am I talking about when I refer to microbes? So microbes is interchangeable with microorganisms which are simply microscopic organisms. So things that you need a microscope to see. So we often probably most uh, primarily associate them with bacteria as depicted here in this Petri dish. Um, we're most familiar with them, right? But microorganisms can also come in the form of fungi. So think of um, yeast and molds, <clears throat> excuse me, are microscopic. Uh, protists, which are animal, plant, or fungal-like, but not exactly those things. So think of your standard amoeba, for example. Something called archaea which are, look very similar to bacteria under a microscope, but they're actually quite distinct in terms of their um, genetics. And then I put viruses, maybe. So we're all too familiar uh, with viruses at this uh, point in our lives, but um, they're not actually uh, living organisms. They're considered sort of at the edge of life because they depend on other organisms to, uh, to reproduce, right, and proliferate. So going back, revisiting this um, diagram again, so all of those different uh, microorganism sort of classifications that I just mentioned also find a home on, in, on and in corals. And uh, in most cases, they're likely playing really important beneficial roles, including um, providing the coral with nutrients, cycling nutrients, um, protection, even UV protection and other modes. And so to scale back up, um, although corals are very small in size, right, they actually have a play really important roles on our planet and have a big impact. So we're all familiar with the roles that microbes play in human disease, right? But in fact, most microorganisms are really beneficial to you. 
Um, for example, our, our gut microbiome keeps us healthy, um, produces vitamins and um, um, helps us to digest certain types of foods that we otherwise wouldn't be able to. <clears throat> they contribute to biotechnology and medicine in the forms of pharmaceuticals, antibiotics. We would not be able to have our wine, beer, cheese, kombucha, um, and yogurt without microorganisms. And some um, of you might not think of this uh, uh, immediately, but they are Earth's ultimate recyclers, right? So once organisms die and start to decay, the microbes come in and do their job of breaking down those molecules into forms that can then be taken up by other living organisms, right? And in fact, microorganisms in the sea provide most of the oxygen in our atmosphere that we breathe. And so microbes are small, they're, they grow very quickly. Um, they're very adaptable because they can change their um, cellular machinery to turn uh, genes on and off, right? So they um, can respond very quickly to what's going on in the environment. And so in that way, they're really useful tools um, to tell us what's going on in the environment. So they can be uh, what's called biological indicators of disturbance and other things. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> and so, um, as I mentioned, microbes live everywhere and can almost uh, um, metabolize essentially anything, right? Um, from organic carbon, but even things like oil, petroleum, and other chemicals, they find a way to do it. And in fact, they are all around us. And as I mentioned, inside of us, right? So how do we study them? So I told you, maybe I lacked a little bit of imagination, but clearly I've, I've boosted that aspect. And I think a lot of us microbiologists like to think, you know, um, when we're out field sampling in the field that this is what's happening, right? You have to be pretty creative to study things that you can't often see. Um, and so we do go out into the field and collect them from various environments. We probably need a much smaller mesh size than what's being used here, but I thought these were uh, pretty uh, wonderful illustrations that kind of capture the magic of, all, of it all. So some traditional methods that we use are microscopy, right? So you can take microorganisms and put them under a microscope. We can use different stains to pull out different features or shapes and look at them that way. We can also try to bring them back in the lab and grow them, which is a really important way to learn about their physiology, but it's also um, um, really difficult because it's hard to mimic their natural environment and what different um, microspatial environments and chemicals and nutrients that they need. And in fact, we cultured, uh, I think at this point, less than 1% of what's actually in nature. Um, so alone, these can be limiting, um, but one method that we've been able to use since uh, technology has been advancing and it's becoming more um, um, cost effective and, and accessible is, well, oops, excuse me, um, molecular biology. But before I get that, the other thing that we're limited by these is that when you place microbes under the microscope or grow them, you only have so many shapes, sizes, and colors, right? So, um, which they can be quite beautiful as, as seen here, but you might have um, two microbes that look exactly the same, but they're actually very genetically distinct or even different species, we'll call them here. We typically don't refer to bacterial species because they don't technically fall under that definition, but for our purposes, we'll, we'll use that word here. So that's where the molecular biology comes in. And in short, we study their DNA. So all living things have a unique genetic code or fingerprint and microbes do as well. So in that way, we may, we're able to distinguish microbes that might look very similar, but are actually very different organisms. Okay, so how do we go about doing that? Um, so this is a schematic I put together. So this is a coral sample here, but you can imagine this could be dirt, um, a biofilm growing somewhere in your home, um, a skin swab sample, what have you. And so you take a bit, so maybe you swab the mucus on this coral or break off a piece and you have your environmental sample. Um, so we need to study the DNA. So we need to get the DNA out of the cells. So you have a bunch of bacterial cells here associated with your, um, your environment, but also you might have other things in there, especially if you took a, broke a piece of this off, you have coral cells in there too, right? So how do we get that out? Um, well, first we pull the DNA, all the DNA out from everything. Um, and then we just want to focus on the bacteria. So we actually use a method called polymerase chain reaction, and it allows us to essentially make copies of the gene that we're interested in looking at, right? So here we're making a bunch of copies of just the bacterial DNA. Then we take that and we put it through a machine called a sequencer. 
And it essentially reads that genetic code. So those A's, T's, C's, G's. If you need a refresher on this, I highly recommend you go back and watch the first Jurassic Park. Excellent film. It has a little intro on DNA. Um, but anyway, so these are uh, constituents of, of DNA, um, the code for life, right? And so we then take that information and we use a reference library that's pre-existing that has different known types of bacteria and their genetic codes. And we can match our samples up against that, lost my mouse there for a second, to tell us exactly who is in our sample, okay? So in this case, we have a lot of this particular microorganism, Clostridium botulinum, and not as much E. coli, for example. So you can also tweak this method in a way to find out not only who's there and how many, but also what they're doing. So you can look at the functional genomics. So is this bacterium producing toxins when this coral is exposed to some type of stressor, right? On the other hand, if this coral is healthy, maybe this microbe is expressing genes for nitrogen fixation, which is beneficial to provide nutrients to the corals. And so you can imagine too, that if you subject corals to different um, environmental stressors, you start to get shifts in this pie, right? Of um, the abundance and the different genes that are turned on and off. And so in that way, they're able to tell us what's going on in the organism and often also what's going on in the environment. So where does all this magic happen? Well, for us, um, it's at the Potomac Science Center, as mentioned, right on the Aquacon River. We have this fantastic new facility. So, you know, we have public space around here. It's a public building. Um, so in non-COVID times, I recommend everyone get out there to check it out. It's a beautiful space. Um, not pictured here is our, our um, we have a floating dock now and which is great to work off of. And we're also um, working on acquiring funds to extend that dock out into the deeper water, the channel, so that we can um, tie up our, our research Carolina skiffs out there. Right now they're around back and we have to go down the street to put them in the water. And then to have big dreams, maybe over time, uh, a, a larger boat that can get us out to the bay. Um, so we have an, a wonderful, um, um, a transdisciplinary group of scientists there. So myself, we have chemists, um, aquatic ecologists, fish ecologists that work out there and we all work together to study the environment. Now, corals don't grow in this environment as it's fresh water, um, but if I, uh, so we have to go other places to get our samples, but um, I like to pretend it's salty. And if you look just at the right angle and the sun is shining, there's this invasive um, uh, vegetation that kind of looks like a particular coral species. So we can, we can all dream big. So my laboratory is, I head up the Salerno Laboratory of Integrative Microbial Ecology. We affectionately refer to ourselves as slime um, because indeed most of the samples we work with are indeed a bit slimy, but it's okay, we have fun with it. So this is before I had fully moved in. I was just so excited to have this space of my own to do science. And this is the beautiful view outside our windows here of what I call the turtle pond, which is full of life and it's just a, a really uh, inspiring place to work. And you can see the Aquacon River and this is on like a cloudy day. So it's, it's quite beautiful and we're happy to be there. So our laboratory engages in uh, numerous different projects that are centered on microbial ecology. So the top um, left and right here are pictures of an ongoing project. And I think my students on the call here, uh, my undergraduate, Tom Hutchinson, and we had a high school student as well. And he initiated a project to look at um, the growth of microbial biofilms on microplastics. So I mentioned previously about a lot of these sort of, at, at the time thought pristine environments that I worked in, there was a lot of plastic pollution. So unfortunately plastic will break down into smaller pieces, but it never really fully goes away. <clears throat> it just breaks into smaller and smaller pieces. So some of the concerns are that, um, organisms can consume these and it can um, damage, um, make them unhealthy. But also there's concern that um, because these plastics stick around forever and they uh, float and they travel, that they might also harbor um, uh, potential pathogens that then can be transported or consumed by organisms. So that was one of the things we were investigating there. And we're also looking at the um, chemicals, harmful chemicals that might ad adsorb to the plastics and be taken up. In the bottom right here is my student, um, my graduate student, Kim, and she has a striped bass there and she's investigating um, a bacterial disease uh, called mycobacteriosis and striped bass. 
It's impacting populations there. The populations are already threatened there to begin with, but this disease kind of leaves them emaciated, shortens their lifespan, may impact their reproduction. And the only true way to test to see if they have it really is, um, unfortunately, after they're already killed, it infects their internal organs, so the spleen and the kidney. Um, but then in a very small percentage <clears throat> of infected individuals, they exhibit these lesions, external lesions on the skin. And so we thought there might be something going on there. Can we look at the microbes on the skin and might they be reflective of some sort of stressor or change when they get infected? Um, and so that's what she's doing there. She's taking a swab of the skin. In this case, we did have to, to kill them so we could do a comparison, but she will compare um, to see if the internal organs are infected and if that correlates in any way with what's going on in the skin microbiome. And then um, I have many other students working on uh, team coral. They're not all depicted here. I need to get some more pictures, but in the center here is um, uh, actually a, a student of my colleague, Esther Peters, who, who I collaborate with on the coral work. Um, these are actually her two graduate students, um, Eric and Zach. Um, there you can see Zach is extracting DNA from coral samples right there in that picture. And I'll talk a little bit later about what um, Eric is working on. And that's kind of the future of where our research is heading. So back to corals. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned this fascination and interest in this symbiosis. And again, these microorganisms are also very good biological indicators of what's going on with the health of the coral and the environment. So um, they do tell us a lot about what's going on especially in terms of environmental stress. So when corals are stressed, um, they, this, this association breaks down. There's a disruption between the coral and the symbiont and they are expelled or released. We're not quite sure of the exact mechanism. They're released from the coral, leaving them um, tissue behind, but white in color because uh, um, it's actually these symbionts that give the corals a lot of their coloration. And so that's referred to as coral bleaching. And right now it really is the most serious threat to corals globally. Um, and I mentioned it's a stress response, but the, the environmental stressor that we see um, most commonly associated with this response is high temperatures or sea surface temperature uh, warming, right? Longer over ambient for an extended period of time. So I mentioned that, you know, these symbionts provide corals with the majority of their nutrition. And indeed, if these um, uh, corals aren't repopulated with the symbionts, they will die essentially of starve to death. So this is a picture showing a healthy reef on the left, a little bit brown in coloration from those symbionts after it's bleached and dying. And in this case, the symbionts were not able to repopulate, the corals died. And the brown that you're seeing here, <clears throat> excuse me, is macroalgae or bigger algae, um, other types of bacteria, cyanobacteria, that start to overgrow this nice new clean surface, right? But then they start to break that skeleton down. So you not only lose the coral organisms, but you also lose all that habitat and food that those other organisms uh, that I showed earlier depend on. So it really is a, a devastating thing to these reefs. And unfortunately, these global coral bleaching events are increasing in both intensity and frequency around the world over the years. So I'll point out a few highlights of this um, um, graph or this figure here, which was actually published in a paper um, by Terry Hughes in Science, Journal Science in 2018. So on the uh, upper left here, you have number of locations and year. Um, so number of locations where severe and moderate bleaching had occurred. And you can see this was a pretty big year. This was one of the first really global um, bleaching events. If you uh, move to the right here, the red line is um, showing um, cumulative number of bleaching events or total, but cumulative and then severe. And you can see over time that they're also increasing drastically. Now the blue line is showing the total number of unbleached locations globally. And unfortunately those are diminishing over time. And these only go up to 2016. And there've been some events after that. The bottom right one here is showing um, that there's an increase in frequency. So it's showing the return times or the years uh, the time period in two um, cohorts here between bleaching events, which is decreasing. So it's quite problematic and of concern. Not to be too much of a, a downer, but unfortunately coral uh, bleaching is not the only thing that we've seen increase over time. We've also seen coral disease. Um, 
increased over time, which also negatively impacts corals. So there are many diseases out there. I mean, there are diseases in any natural population. Um, and honestly, for most of them, we don't, uh, we haven't identified the causative agent or a pathogenic agent. For those few that we have, that we think we might understand what's going on, um, it's typically associated with bacteria, not because that's the most common, but I think it's because those are the easiest to study and uh, versus like viruses, for example, and actually, you know, as I mentioned, they're, they're still quite difficult to study. So what I want to point out here is some of these different diseases where you have some potential pathogens here. In one case, you know, it's a single pathogen, others, it might be several. And then in others, it's actually a consortium of microbes that are thought to cause disease like black band disease. So just as the field evolves and we start to lose, use different tools and learn more, we're kind of moving away from this idea of one disease, um, one pathogen, right? Um, and looking at more um, op options and holistically that it's possible it can be a consortium. And then it's also possible that these are stress responses and that typical structured healthy microbiome shifts in response to stressors, causing it, uh, what's called a dysbiosis. <clears throat> and so this next diagram here actually is a model of that that depicts the situation. So you have a single coral polyp here with the tentacles in the center. On the left is a happy, healthy microbiome and a happy, healthy coral holobiont. It's got nice, um, healthy uh, symbionts, the zooxanthellae in um, the cells. It's got a thick mucus layer with lots of rich microbes there. And then as it become subjected to heat stress, or you can imagine this is some other type of stressor in the environment, pollution, whatnot, sedimentation. Um, these habitats start to degrade and you start to see um, some of the symbionts die. It actually becomes uh, increasingly diverse, which we usually associate um, diversity with a positive thing in nature. In this case, it's showing something different because that diversity means it's actually becoming increasingly dysbiotic, meaning it started out with a really structured, um, um, uh, microbiome is what we call it. Uh, so microbial community, and now it's kind of all over the place, right? And that also throws off the function because the microbes uh, perform different metabolic functions. And so then um, we start to see disease state or bleaching. And so this gives us an idea again, of reflective of what's going on in the environment and how the coral might be responding and how it impacts the health host of, excuse me, health host, host health. There we go. So I now want to move on to discussing <clears throat> this uh, newly emergent disease that first showed up in 2014 that I'm working with my colleague Esther Peters, uh, also in my department on. And so here at Mason, we're working on it, but it's actually an extensive group across the country that is attacking, uh, studying this disease from many different angles um, because it's quite concerning. Um, so it affects over 22 reef building coral species and uh, the pathogen, I mean, this, the disease itself spreads quickly uh, over a geographic area, but also across a colony, as you can see here, uh, in just a short amount of time, um, um, causing mortality. And so it was first observed off the port of Miami in 2014. Actually, there was a dredging project occurring there, and uh, folks had gone out to do an environmental impact assessment, I believe, and they noticed this outbreak of some disease that they had not observed before. I do want to note in case I forget later that um, uh, to come full circle, I think they've determined um, so far that it doesn't seem to be associating with that dredging event actually, it just uh, happened to correspond with that. Since that time, it spread northward, southward along the Florida reef tract across the Caribbean and now into um, the Western Caribbean. So most recently showing up in Roatan, Honduras earlier this fall. And so it's of great concern because as I mentioned, it spreads really quickly, it's highly lethal, um, and we still don't know what is causing it. That being said, there is some evidence that it might be bacterial, and I'll talk about that in a moment. What's also interesting about this disease is that it doesn't impact all of these coral species in the same way. So some are highly susceptible and our others are um, intermediate or not as susceptible. Um, but unfortunately, the ones that are starred here also happen to be corals that are endangered. So again, it's quite concerning. And this, um, this mosaic here is showing different maize or brain corals. So their arrangements of polyps are really cool. They're in these sort of labyrinth form formations. Um, this is a whole colony. So again, the colonies have many polyps across the surface and a skeleton underneath. So what you're seeing on the right is diseased corals as this um, 
pathogen, whatever it is, or response, this disease response moves across the colony and it's called um, stony coral tissue loss disease because it rapidly degrades the, the tissue overlaying the skeleton. So that's new skeleton being um, um, exposed there and um, it's killing off the live tissue. So this is a, a different than bleaching and it looks a lot different as well. So I mentioned, we think it might be bacterial in nature and that's because people, folks are really proactive. Managers were proactive about this disease. They sent out groups as this disease was spreading across the, um, I keep saying it's the pathogen as this disease was being observed moving across the Caribbean. They sent out folks to actually move ahead of the disease front and sort of rescue these coral colonies and put them in aquaria until it was safe to put them back in. There's also been numerous transmission studies in the laboratory where when they applied antibiotic paste and even probiotic paste, it actually stopped the tissue loss from happening. So whether or not these uh, microbes or bacteria are the primary causative agent of this disease, or if it's their secondary infection, they certainly have some role in the disease progression. Although there is the possibility it could be abiotic factors and this could be a stress response of the corals. So, um, that moves on to some of the work that um, my colleague and I are doing on uh, studying uh, this disease. So I talked about um, some of our tools in the toolbox for studying microbes and Esther and I like to combine our expertise and, and put them together. And it's, it's a really um, um, advantageous way to study uh, microorganisms in the environment. So Esther is a world-class disease ecologist, especially uh, coral disease. And she is a very skilled histologist. Um, so that's when you take uh, biological samples, uh, you embed them in some wax and you slice them very thin and you can look at them under a microscope, right? So if you got a biopsy, something similar, the doctor. Um, so we uh, received funding from the state of Florida, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection um, to team up. We have our own group, but um, there are many um, other, as I mentioned, groups uh, um, investigating this disease from multiple angles. We took a little bit of a different approach. Um, we were interested in what's called the um, endolithic microbiome, okay? So what you're looking at here in this picture is imagine you have a coral colony and you cut it in half, okay? So this is, um, the polyps are retracted because this is out of the water now, but this is where the little polyps sit. This brownish tissue is the, the live tissue overlaying the skeleton. So you can see how extensive uh, the skeleton can be, right? So this animal built the skeleton, right, with its symbionts. So here's the skeleton underneath, but you can see it's not just all white skeleton here. There's a lot going on. There's a lot growing in the skeleton. So many of the microorganisms I talked about, fungus, um, bacteria, archaea, viruses, right? So what's really interesting about this disease is um, when Esther and some of her colleagues put, it, put uh, uh, disease corals under the microscope and looked at them, they noticed something really interesting. They noticed that the tissue was really degraded in the basal layers close to the skeleton and that the, the zooxanthellae were also starting to break down close to the skeleton. It was almost as if the corals were being like attacked or eaten from the inside out, right? So the majority of work that was being done where people were going um, and swabbing the mucus, they have a real mucusy layer um, at this interface or airbrushing the tissue off, right? And we thought we might be missing something really important by not studying or looking at what's in this skeleton, the endolithic microbiome. And so that's what our study focused on. Um, and we also brought in someone to look at the coral immune response. So determining how the coral cells were dying, was it necrosis? So are they, are they dying in response to being infected with microbes? Are they engaging in something called apoptosis or programmed cell death where the, the cells, um, basically if they're, they're responding to a stressor, they essentially, uh, commit cell suicide, right? I will focus on the microbiome portion because that is my area of expertise. So I'm going to show you some of the results we've had, and this is an ongoing study. So in a nutshell, we did find patterns in both the bacteria and fungi um, in the community composition of those uh, microbes based on what uh, uh, host species of coral we were looking at. We looked at a variety of different species and the disease state, whether it was a apparently healthy colony, a uh, diseased colony at the disease uh, lesion margin or um, still relatively healthy coral tissue that was left on a disease colony. And so what I want to point out from this graph, there's a lot going on. Um, on the left hand, uh, on the, um, the, the y-axis here, this is the relative percentage of different microorganisms in a particular sample. So these are all the different samples. I know you can't read the labels, but I'll point out the highlights here. 
Um, so the different colors represent different bacterial species or phylotypes as we refer to them. And so in some of the previous studies of the tissue only, they found, they kept finding um, a bacteria within this class Clostridium. And so it's actually an anaerobic bacteria. So it lives, thrives in the absence of oxygen. Um, it's often uh, um, disease causing in other organisms. So we found this bacterium too, and it's depicted in the, by the peach bars here, but we didn't find it. We found it across all our samples, right? So there are portions of this um, endolithic microbiome that very much might be um, anoxic, right? Lacking oxygen. And so we didn't see that it correlated with any pattern um, between species, coral species or health state. So it was in both diseased and healthy corals. So next we did pull out this other microbe from the class Blastocatelia, which is also kind of fun to say. And that's highlighted um, in yellow in both these two species, Copophilia natans and Diploria labyrinthformis. Those are some of those maze looking corals. And so what we found here is that it actually seemed to be elevated in the diseased corals, uh, even in the tissue that hadn't yet, um, wasn't at the disease lesion margin, but from a diseased colony. So, the interesting thing about this one, and that we often find in microbes, uh, studying environmental microbiology, is not much is known about this particular class. There are only a few genera and species, but there is one interesting one that is an anoxygenic photoheterotroph. So what does that mean? It's a microbe that can perform photosynthesis um, in the absence of oxygen. Well, it doesn't use um, oxygen as a terminal electron uh, acceptor. And it, um, it relies on organic carbon. Um, so it doesn't make its own food like plants do. It actually needs to you know, eat a sandwich like we do to incorporate carbon, organic carbon into uh, its cellular material. So it's one that's kind of worth um, further exploring, uh, but we don't know um, much about it. So when we looked at the fungi, we also found something interesting. This Cortinarius genus, which is brown, it was particularly uh, abundant in those Copophilia natans samples, but um, more ab abundant in the diseased colonies, right? What's really interesting about this one is that it's actually a terrestrial fungus. And so this brings up questions because there are two things going on there. We have found in some other coral diseases that there are terrestrial fungi that might be responsible for causing, uh, or for, um, for causing disease, like in sea fans, Gorgonian, Gorgonian sea fans. Um, the other possibility going on here is remember I mentioned that reference library database? Well, we're only as good as our library. And unfortunately, um, fungi in the environment, particularly in the marine environment, are really understudied. So it could be possible that this was a close match, but it's actually some other type. So we do find some evidence that we see some patterns of potential biological indicators of disease. So it could be a response to the infection, or maybe they're even <clears throat> the patho pathogenic agent themselves. So we want to further investigate this. And so the one thing we're limited by, right, but it's the part place where we all start is we take our sample and we grind it up, right? So everything's mixed up all together and we lose any kind of spatial organization of where these microbes actually are in relation to the coral, right? Even if we're taking the skeleton. And so what Eric um, is doing in this lower corner is employing the use of something called laser capture microdissection where you can actually go in, um, do a histological section. So this is where Esther and I take our expertises and our worlds um, um, combine. And, and um, we uh, are really um, excited to employ, and it, it makes both stronger, right? So <clears throat> he's able to go in and look at maybe where there might be tissue degradation, cells dying and microbes around that area and actually pull those individual microbes out. So we can then do the same process of sequencing their genetic code and then identify what they are. So now we can say where those microbes are in relation to the coral organism itself. And it tells us a lot more about what's going on inside the coral in terms of um, the disease. So I don't wanna end on that note of just talking about disease. I am very hopeful for reefs. Um, we, we have a lot of things we can still do to sort of turn the ship around in terms of mitigating some of the stressors that are really severely impacting the corals, like sea surface temperature increases. We can change our behaviors and habits um, by reducing our carbon footprints. Um, there, we've seen a huge surge in coral restoration, which I would admittedly at first when it started a bit skeptical, but I've seen amazing things. And I'd love, I'd love to be proven wrong in this instance. So um, there are folks, nonprofits that are um, 
working with scientists to outplant hardy corals. So they're breeding for resilience. Um, so corals that are naturally resistant to some of these stressors and um, um, working to increase the genetic diversity of those outplants as well. So that's a hope, a bright spot. And then finally, the brightest spot I think is um, through science research and environmental education, right? And that's what we tr really try to foster here at Mason. So I'll end in, in talking about this program that we've developed here with my colleagues. I, must, I mentioned um, Dr. Esther Peters and Dr. Tom Wood. Um, and so we offer several courses that are scaffolded. So I teach a lecture course to teach students all about the ecology, the organisms, the corals themselves. And then Tom and Esther and I, but especially Tom and Esther <clears throat> teach the lab and field component but we're not only teaching them about the academic side about what's in the books, but Tom trains them in diving specifically to be scientific divers. Esther trains them to be able to ID corals in the field, um, to be able to ID coral disease in the field. Tom works with fish identification. We have them practicing conducting underwater field work. So working underwater, laying transects and doing surveys and collecting data. But then even more importantly, um, when they come back, we want them to be able to disseminate that information. So another program that I'm really proud of that I've worked on with several other colleagues from across the College of Science is a science policy minor and graduate certificate program, which that latter portion is in development, so that students, once they come out of the water and see these observations, are able to step into the offices of the decision makers and policy makers that are really shaping the laws and policies that impact these ecosystems. And so, um, we have many great, wonderful things to come. Um, uh, we were set to go to Roatan, Honduras, which I mentioned is one of the places where this disease showed up on the scene more recently. Unfortunately, um, our past two trips there were canceled due to COVID, but we were already planning our trip for uh, next May. So we are hopeful. And then also we, uh, this first, uh, for the first time we offered this summer as a summer course, Introduction to Science Policy, which is part of our minor that we're developing. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention and being part of the process of, um, you know, educating yourself on these issues, which is really important to um, uh, uh, making sure these, these ecosystems persist in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. This was um, an amazing presentation uh, and I'm sure uh, it has sparked a lot of curiosity uh, because of it's 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 such a wide ranging um, set of topics that you discussed, and it's uh, it's uh, incredible to see how microbes are involved in just about anything that happens, right? <laughs> um, it's really amazing. Um, we do have a few questions, uh, so uh, I'll I'll just read them out, and you can respond to them, and then we can move on. Um, I think the first one is. Uh, um, how do you how do you sample coral microbes underwater? Yeah, so it takes a lot of um, practice and forethought because uh, you have to bring a lot of stuff down with you. You have bags hanging off of you. You need to think about uh, keeping things well. They're not sterile in the environment, but relatively sterile. So we bring back these down these little basically almost like little Ziploc bags, and um, some people just sample the mucus with a syringe. Um, we often take a little biopsy if we're sampling the skeleton, you delicately take a little core or break it off, which makes me feel a bit better. I mentioned the coral organisms are colonial, so you don't have to kill the whole organism. And then we put those into little bags and label them and keep them on the ice and, and bring them back to the lab. So we do most of this on scuba. So you can do it on um, snorkeling, but it's a lot more difficult. You have to dive up and down, which actually can be dangerous with like shallow water blackout. Um, but so that's why the scientific diving training really comes, uh, is really important because you not only have to be paying attention to working safely underwater and not losing your stuff, but you got to pay attention to your air consumption, um, that you don't stay down too long. So it's a lot of, uh, a, a big skill set to build upon, to be able to do this work. Great. Um, here's another one, uh, are nematodes microbes and what do they do? <laughs> are nematodes microbes? Well, they're not, I mean, like, like I said, it's microorganisms in general is kind of a fuzzy description. They wouldn't uh, technically be considered, you can see most of them uh, with the naked eye. So they, they play a lot of roles. So they can help with moving nutrients around as well. Um, they're often parasitic, right? And so, um, although we think, oh, what good is that doing? It actually does help to uh, shape populations, right? And keep them in, in check as well. 
Um, so those are some of the ecological roles. Um, they're really interesting to study and a lot of folks use them as a model organism in biology as well. So, um, but that's probably my extent to my knowledge uh, of nematodes. They're a little too big on the size spectrum for me. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. okay. Um, can you say more about what kinds of interesting bacteria are found in the Chesapeake Bay or the Occoquan River? Sure, so we're still learning more about that. There's um, uh, just in the Chesapeake Bay, um, one interesting one, so we might not realize. So for 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 a bit, great part of history, you know, we're aware of um, cholera, right? The disease cholera, and it's caused by a microorganism, um, uh, Vibrio cholerae. And so for the longest time, uh, we didn't realize that there is a natural reservoir. It is found in, in brackish water ecosystems. It was actually Rita Colwell, who is a local and a very famous um, um, marine uh, microbiologist and sort of a, a, someone I really look up to, um, that she actually made that discovery that there, the natural reservoir is in the environment. So um, that's a microbe that if it's ingested by humans, it can make you sick. Um, but it does live in natural populations. There are other species of Vibrio that live in the Bay that are not harmful. And in fact, there's other Vibrio species in other parts of the world that are symbionts. Um, let's see, what else? I mean, there's such a diversity. Those are some interesting ones. There's other Vibrio that you hear about every now and then of folks getting a bad infection if they go into the water with a cut. So it is really important that you rinse your skin off with fresh water after doing that. But I don't want to focus too much on the negative because most of the microbes are actually doing really good things, right? Um, a lot of microbes are actually photosynthetic as well. So they produced um, oxygen, right? Oxygenate the water and keep it healthy. Um, we do know that in the Chesapeake Bay, when we have too much uh, pollution, it can kind of offset the natural cycle of things and you get what's called a, um, a harmful algal bloom or plankton bloom. So at first you get a lot of stuff growing, but then it dies and it kind of depletes all the oxygen. And that's a problem in the Chesapeake Bay. And we see this during the summer because the oysters can't get up and move away, right? And if it's very extensive, the crabs can't either. And um, it can cause uh, die-offs of some of the larger organisms or higher organisms in, in the bay. So yeah, there's lots of different micro, um, tons of microbial diversity in the bay. Um, in the Aquacon River, um, again, uh, very similar, lots of diversity. We're learning more and more about it through our studies, especially uh, some of the work I'm doing with colleagues where we're looking at downstream of some of the wastewater um, treatment plants. So uh, which some are the largest in, in the world actually. And I wanna deviate on and, and that for a minute because I forgot to mention, I promised I would, that one of the other projects I'm working on with that colleague is we're actually doing wastewater monitoring of um, SARS-CoV-2 on Mason's campus. So another facet of environmental microbiology is that uh, you know, we're able to use these same molecular tools I talked about to then investigate uh, environmental microbes in a human health um, sort of context. Great. Uh, so since the pandemic, we see a lot of resurgence of wildlife in areas that have been historically impacted by human activity. Have you seen any evidence that this has also occurred in coral or other marine environments over the past year? That's a fantastic question. And I will be excited when I hear some of the results because I know there's an ongoing study in Hawaii, if anyone's ever visited there, it's uh, Hanauma Bay, which is a fantastic marine park in a reef. Um, <clears throat> they noticed that it was kind of getting overwhelmed to get thousands of visitors a day, then it was shut down for COVID. But prior to that, they were taking a day off per week to give it kind of a break. And there are folks out there that are monitoring, um, just as you mentioned, is there a return? Is there more wildlife? Are the corals doing better? I don't. I think that study is ongoing, but I think in fact, we are seeing that in some places, right? So we definitely, um, our presence definitely impacts the behavior of other organisms and the health of, of organisms. Okay. Um, uh, I have read that deeper, water coral are doing better than shallow water corals. What about that? So it kind of depends on where it is. So if you're deep water coral off the coast of Florida, you've had some impacts from trawling. So trawling is a method of fishing where they essentially drag a net across the benthos or the bottom of the ocean floor and get everything in there. So as you can imagine, it's like bulldozing the rainforest to catch a, a toucan or something, right? So it destroys the habitat. And the the deep water corals are actually usually much more slower growing, so it takes a long time for them to recover. In other areas where not, they're not impacted by that, um, 
they're actually seeing that the deep water corals might be just as impacted by the, the temperature warming and, and ocean acidification as some of the shallow water corals. Um, but they do have a refuge in some sense in that um, they're typically removed from population centers um, and uh, maybe they probably do receive some pollution, uh, but not to the extent that the shallow uh, coral reefs are. It is important to note that, that those are two really different ecosystems because the deep corals um, are, are actually different species and they don't have the, the symbionts that live inside them, the zooxanthellae. And um, so unfortunately, it's not like if we if all the shallow water corals died that those could then cut, replace them. So um, both that are impacted from different um, stressors. Okay. Um, what media do you use to culture the microorganisms you sample? Yeah, so that's a good question. And it really depends on the microbe you're trying to grow. You have to figure out what it likes to eat. And it's really tricky. And some of them are very fastidious. So um, <clears throat> I don't do as much culturing work now. <clears throat> I did used to do it in the lab I did my PhD in. And so you can use liquid, you can use um, agarose, which is um, a gelatinous substance, right, derived from um, from seaweed essentially. And you can add all different types of things in there. So if we're trying to grow a vibrio, like I was talking about, you want to add a little bit of salt in there because they like a salty medium. Same if you're trying to grow um, skin microbes, you add a little salt in the media. Um, if they're a microbe that's anaerobic, like I mentioned, you want to make sure that there's no oxygen in there. So you have to really um, tailor it to whatever type of microbe you're growing. And that's what makes it so challenging too. Um, uh, to grow them. So yeah, we use all different types in, in the lab, especially for our lab course, all different types of media um, to grow all different types of microorganisms. Great. Um, is there a temperature range for healthy corals? Uh, and is that range changing? Yeah. So I think off the top of my head, it's typically between like what, 25 and 27, I want to say, or 28. And so um, that's like a, a typical range that they like to live in warmer waters. They're typically around the equator. So I didn't give all the background, um, 30 degrees north and south. They like warm, clear tropical waters. They need the sunlight for their photosynthetic symbionts, right? Um, and so that it's relatively warm, but if it gets too warm, even just a degree or two, which doesn't sound like a lot to us, right? So a degree or two Celsius though is quite large. If you imagine your internal body temperature increasing by that much, you'd be in trouble, right? You'd have a, a high fever. And so um, once they go outside of that range, uh, it's difficult for them to survive if they're subjected to that for extended time. Good. Um, are there specific culturing or incubation techniques when growing microorganisms from deep marine environments? Yeah, so um, it depends. Like I said, you wanna tailor it. So if it's a microbe that lives and, and so the deeper you go, the more pressure you get. So those are called barophiles or pressure loving microbes. We also have something called psychrophiles, which are cold loving microbes. So you would want to make sure that you would incubate them maybe in the cold in a pressurized system. And also of course, figuring out the recipe of what types of food they like to eat. Um, so yeah, it's uh, a lot of uh, room to explore a lot of different things there and get creative. Um, and there are a lot of folks that work on that and they, we discover new microorganisms all the time. That's why it's kind of a really cool field to be in as well. You're always discovering something new. Yeah, we're, we're about to run out of time. So I'll, I'll, I'll summarize the last question, um, sure. which is very, very interesting. So was there a particular event that got you interested in science policy and what type of science policy work that you do at the state department? Sure. So I'll try to wrap this up. So it was an event where I made a one last attempt to study large organisms. I went to Costa Rica and volunteered for um, a summer and uh, in between going to Antarctica. And it was the longest running sea turtle program in the world. It was very successful in numbers, but I noticed there were a lot of issues. There was a poacher, which was illegal, but we knew who it was. It just wasn't enforced. There was trash all over the nesting beaches because the funding for the recycling plant had been removed. And we tried to go educate the students at the schools, but sometimes the school would be shut down. And also we were, we were a bunch of foreigners in this very small community coming in to this place. And so uh, that was a light bulb moment for me that seems obvious now that science alone cannot solve our conservation issues. It's much more about managing the behavior of people. And so um, from then on, I really wanted to set out to, to um, learn more about that really. And so the work I did at the State Department, I worked on a lot of international science policy. And so even though my background is mostly marine, I had done some energy policy as well. So 
I actually worked in this bureau that was economic policy, but um, I had the science policy portfolio. So I would go to international meetings representing the United States um, as part of things like um, the energy working group or the oceans and fisheries working group of this group called the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, which is a really big um, multi um, national or international forum. And so um, I was sort of the expert in the room on those issues. And if I wasn't, I went and found the expert and got the information I needed. So it was a really cool spot to be. I got to travel all over. I got to dive on that reef in Papua New Guinea I showed in my final slide. And I got to learn a lot. And it was a great way to be of service really to, to the country. So I, I really recommend uh, public service work as well if you're interested. Well, that's wonderful. Um, listen, thanks for, for this compelling presentation and for your dedication uh, and, and the wonderful things you do. This was really amazing. Um, you never stop learning and you never stop being uh, uh, surprised by, by, by scientific discovery. So I really wanna, really wanna thank you. I also wanna thank everyone for joining us uh, for this really extraordinary discussion. Um, I hope in the not so distant future, we can all meet down at our, at our beautiful research facility on the Occoquan, the yeah. Potomac Science Center, where where Dr. Salerno's uh, lab is, is, um, is, uh, is there and then she showed us pictures of it and get a firsthand experience of, of the research on the way there. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. S thanks again, Dr. Salerno, uh, Jennifer for, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you all so much. Great questions. Take care. Thank you.